1961, the Green Bay Packers squandered a fourth quarter lead and lost the NFL championship. The following year, the players gathered together at training camp, completely demoralized, but ready to master new strategies and plays. Instead, their coach, Vince Lombardi, walked into the locker room and holding up a pigskin began, gentlemen, this is a football. Something had gone very wrong for his team to have lost what should have been an easy victory. Lombardi concluded that his players had forgotten the fundamentals of the game. So that season, he started from scratch, as if these 38 elite players were blank slates, and he rebuilt the team's knowledge on the basics, how to block and tackle and pass from the ground up. Similarly, the Western world lost what should have been an obvious win, the battle for marriage. We fumbled because we took our eyes off the ball and got distracted by religious liberty questions, the self-interest of adults, and accusations of being on the wrong side of history. So just like the Packers of 1961, conservatives must recover the fundamentals of the family. So let's begin with the basics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a child. This child is created when the gametes of one man and the gametes of one woman fuse to create her new, unique human life. Not only is this one man and one woman required for her life to begin, but they are also critical for her life to thrive. When one or both are absent, her body, mind, and heart suffers. The loss of a child's father impacts children at the cellular level. Boys especially who experience father loss have shorter telomeres, the end caps of their chromosomes. Father loss to death or abandonment literally shortens a child's lifespan. Daughters raised apart from their biological father begin menstruating on average one year earlier than their girlfriends who are being raised by their own dads. The loss of their father alters children's physical bodies. This is a child. As she grows, she deserves to be safe and loved. After decades of social scientists, after decades of research, social scientists on the left and the right have discovered the conditions that make it most likely that she will be safe and loved. And that is being raised by the one man and one woman who gave her life. The data reveals that biological parents advantage children in ways that unrelated adults do not. Statistically, step-parents invest less time, money, and care into this child's upbringing. In blended families, biological children are 15% more likely to have regular medical checkups, 22% more likely to be buckled up in the car, have 5% more money spent on their food, and they are more likely to attend college. Step-parents save less money for children's education and bequeath less money to them when they die. Thankfully, there are heroic step-parents who step up to fill in the gap of a negligent biological parents. They deserve our recognition and support. But overall, the presence of an unrelated adult in a child's home diminishes child outcomes. That's especially true when the unrelated adult is a man. If this child is living with her mother's cohabiting boyfriend, she's 11 times more likely to be sexually physically or emotionally abused. Researchers Martin Daly and Margot Wilson found that children were 120 times more likely to be beaten to death by mother's boyfriend or a stepfather than their own biological dad. Sociologist Bradford Wilcox notes, one of the most dangerous places children can find themselves in America is in the home that includes an unrelated man. The risk that unrelated adults pose to children is the very reason why adoptive parents like me and like many of you were 
subjected to rigorous screenings and background checks prior to having a child placed in our home. That's because biology affords a level of protection to this child that a romantic interest in her mother or father simply never will. The man and woman who made this child are the safest, most invested adults in her life. Being raised by those two adults are her best shot at being safe and loved. This is a child. The man and woman who made her are also the only two humans on the planet who provide her with something that she seeks, her biological identity. Children struggle to answer the question, who am I, when they can't answer the question, whose am I? Fifty years ago, the majority of adoptions were closed with no identifying information or contact with the child's first family. Today, 95% of adoptions have some degree of openness. That's because both adoptees and social workers report that children fare better when they have as much contact with their first family as possible, even if they can't be raised by them. Some children are intentionally severed from a biological parent at conception via sperm or egg donation. Far from being some stranger who doesn't matter because love makes a family, these children often go on protracted in internet searches and 23andMe pursuits to find their missing parent or dozens of half-siblings. The largest study ever conducted on donor-conceived children found they experience profound struggles with their origins and identities. One survey of sperm and egg donor children found that 64% agree, my donor is half of who I am. And 81% often wonder what personality traits, skills, and physical similarities they share with their donor. It seems that even when children are raised by a loving mother and father, they still long to be known by the one man and one woman who gave them life. This is a child, and if she is raised by the two adults who gave her life, she will also developmentally benefit from the perfect gender balance in her home. Mom's higher oxytocin levels optimize nurturing and bonding in her first three years. Dad's increased testosterone transforms a laundry basket into a roller coaster ride. Her fine motor skills will be honed when she chops carrots with mom. Her gross motor skills will be honed when racing down the street with dad. Her female parent naturally simplifies her language when talking to this child. Did you get a boo-boo? Her male parent expands her cognitive development by talking to her like he talks to everyone else. <laughs> Dang, baby, that's a gnarly road rash. <laughs> One parent's default attitude is safety. Be careful on the monkey bars. The other naturally pushes her limits. You can make it if you get a running start. <laughs> this is a child. The one man and one woman who made her also give her the distinct love she hungers for. You see, kids don't just want to be loved. They seek maternal and paternal love. But you don't need to take it from me. Take it from kids who grew up with two moms or two dads. Theodore shares, from an early age, I found myself drawn to my father's friends. I think my lesbian parents knew what they, that this was necessary for me. My best friend's dad also probably recognized the role he was fulfilling in my life and did so willingly, something I will forever be grateful for. Samantha remembers, my five-year-old brain could not understand why I didn't have the mom I desperately wanted. I felt the loss. I felt the hole. As I grew, I tried to fill that hole with aunts, my dad's lesbian friends and teachers. I craved a mother's love, even though I was well-loved by my two gay dads. This is a child. She comes from one man and one woman. She craves the love of that man and woman. She discovers her identity through that man and woman. Her development is maximized by that man and woman. 
she is most likely to be safe and loved when raised by that man and woman. And according to biology, natural rights, and 192 countries which have ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, she has a right to that man and that woman. There is only one delivery system. Every society throughout hu human history has discovered, affirmed, and promoted to secure this child's right to the man and woman that made her every day, all day, for life. That delivery system is marriage. When we understand that this is a child, the definition of marriage becomes a matter of justice. And the redefinition of marriage to exclude a mother or father is an act of injustice. This is a child. The opinions of five Supreme Court justices cannot change her. Dystopic processes of creating children in laboratories cannot change her. Endlessly repeating, if the adults are happy, the kids will be happy, cannot change her. Our laws, our technology, and our culture will either recognize and respect who she is and what she needs, or it will victimize her. Those are the only two options. This is a child. She's not an item to be cut and pasted into any and every adult relationship. She is not an object of rights. She is a subject of rights. Respecting her rights insists that all adults, single, married, gay, straight, fertile, and infertile, do hard things on her behalf. Because the only alternative is to insist that she do hard things for them. And that's an injustice. A just society does not force the weak to sacrifice for the strong. This is a child. If she loses her mother or father due to abuse, neglect, or abandonment, adults do not have a right to adopt her. Rather, she has a right to be adopted. And whenever possible, she deserves to be adopted into a family where she can benefit from the maternal and paternal love that will maximize her development and satisfy her soul. This is a child, and in matters of marriage and family, she deserves your empathy, not adults. It is the risk and instability of a revolving door of adults to which she will be subjected that should be at the forefront of your mind when reading that New York Times op-ed promoting open non-monogamy. It is this child, not just the florist or the baker, who needs defending when we debate the laughably named Respect for Marriage Act. It is this child's mother hunger and identity struggles that should govern your response when your favorite classical liberal podcaster announces that he's intentionally created a motherless surrogate baby or two. That's because it will always be this child whose rights and well-being are sacrificed on the altar of modern family. This is a child. She does not blog. She can't submit amicus briefs. She can't lobby her congressman. She can't hire lawyers, and she can't speak at conferences. She cannot defend her own rights. This child is completely dependent on adults coming to her defense and speaking up on her behalf. What happened to the 1961 Green Bay Packers? They became the best in the league at tasks that everyone else took for granted. Six months later, after Lombardi's This Is a Football speech, the Packers shut out the New York Giants 37 to zero in the NFL championship. Ladies and gentlemen, if you always remember that this is a child, you'll never lose a marriage and family battle again. <laughs>